Today we have John Murray. John Murray is the golf professional at Murray Golf Club in Scotland. This is Jeff's uh, home course in Scotland. This is uh, where he has been a member for a while now. Um, I'm sure he's going to have fun with this one. Uh, enjoy. So hello everyone and welcome back to Travel Royally. We're thrilled that you could join the Travel Royally podcast today and it's our pleasure to welcome John Murray of the Murray Golf Club in Lossie Mouth, Scotland. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. Pleasure to be here and uh, hello everybody watching. How's the weather there at the moment? Uh, the weather, you know what, it's actually not been too bad this week. We've, we've actually had a, uh, it's been pretty dry. Um, we've had a bit of wind of late. It's been a, a little bit windy, but you know what, it's not been, it's not been too bad the winter. Um, without, you know, the wind has been maybe the a few weeks of pretty high winds. But apart from that, we've not had, you know, we've not really had any snow. We've had a couple of little drops of snow over the winter, but it's, it's pretty much, you know, disappeared, you know, by the following morning. Courses have been fully back open the next day. So, so it's it's actually been not too bad. You know, we can't we can't really complain. Well, for those of you who haven't been to Murray, the backdrop behind me is the Murray Golf Club at sunset. Not and that's a live and that's a live picture, isn't it, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I wish. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. For those, uh, I we just signed up. Actually, when we're done, I have to call Stevie Grant. We've got six guys coming over for the Murray Open. Okay. So he's held some spots for us. I'm one of those elderly people he refers to don't use the computer. Well, that was the guys under which he reserved our spot. I probably should edit that out of here, but um, we're really excited to come over. And for those of you who haven't been to the Murray open, it's a wonderful golf week. The closest thing that we have in America to it, I would say is the, a member guest at a golf club. It's, it's more social than anything else, unless you're in the scratch section, then it's kind of serious. But behind me, you can see the 18th green. And uh, there's a natural amphitheater there. So on the final day, which is a Friday, it's, John, it's a wonderful place to sit, have a beer, watch the, uh, the good players come in. And uh, so hopefully when we go there this summer, we'll have uh, weather like you see behind us, right? Absolutely. We've been we've actually been blessed with the weather over the last kind of few Murray Opens. And, you know, fingers crossed it always stays that way. I mean, we have 336 people playing in it. So it's, you know, it's one off, if not the biggest sort of amateur event in, in the UK. Um, so the fact that we have the two 18 hole courses kind of allows us to, to get a, a huge number. And when you think that, that, you know, like the Open Championship, that, you know, they have about somewhere a bit in the region of 160 people playing, you know, um, throughout the day. And that's on from, you know, seven in the morning through till four in the afternoon. You know, 336 competitors is a, is a pretty big, uh, pretty big deal. And, you know, um, it's a great week, you know, that many people just uh, being around the club. And like I say, if we can get the weather like it is behind you in that picture just now, it really does add to it. You get everybody sort of gathering around the, it's like an amphitheater around that 18th green. And so you get everybody coming out, sitting with a beer after their game of golf, regardless of whether they've had a good day or a bad day. You know, I think that's the great thing about it is everybody obviously would love to do well in the, the competition themselves. But they have a, a good day on the golf course or a bad day. They all, they all tend to have a great week. Yeah, um, that, you know, you're absolutely golf, right. It's such a, such a social week, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned the numbers that will be there. Um, 336. When John Thompson was the captain and I was kind of an unofficial historian, I did a lot of research on the club and I found that in 1895, which was the year after the USGA was founded and the first year of the US Open, they had 12 competitors in the US Open and at the Murray Open, we had 112 players. So really, at you. some point, there was a point where the Murray Open was bigger and arguably more popular than the U.S. Open. Hey, well, that's a great bit of history. That I, I'll uh, I'll steal that one. There, there um, you go. Now, John, you're um, obviously you're Scottish. Where are you from in Scotland? You're not from Murrayshire, are you? I am actually. Yeah, yeah. So oh. I, I'm actually from Elgin, which is just obviously 
five miles inland, which uh, you know has its has its great own sort of golf course, albeit a sort of more Parkland uh, style course. But yeah, no, I'm from I'm from Elgin. I did move away, and I, I spent you know a number of years away from Elgin. Um, you know, again doing my PJ training and things, um, and then I kind of you know I moved back to the area, so I'd been away for uh, probably about fifteen years, and then obviously the opportunity arose. Um, Alistair Thompson, um, uh, the the previous professional who was there for thirty four years, he was he was retiring, and and obviously it was a great opportunity to come back, be be home. Um, as I say, my my parents and my my sister and. Uh, both my sisters are are they live in, in Elgin or, or close to Elgin, so it was nice to come back and uh, you know come back home basically. Now, if we start at the beginning, how did you get into golf? Did you start playing at Elgin? Um, I started playing at that time. Um, Elgin uh, and Murray. I mean, I lived in Elgin at the time, and so Elgin was probably the course that I initially looked at to to join as a junior member of the golf club. Uh, I mean, at that time, it was really quite difficult to get in. There was there was definitely uh, more waiting lists back then than we, we probably do have now. Um, so I had my name down um, as a junior member on the waiting list. And I actually uh, started, uh, my first club was really a, a small nine-hole course called Rothis Golf Club. Okay. Have you played Rothis before? I Ken? haven't. I haven't. No. No. Um, and so at that point, I mean, it was literally joined as a junior member. It would have been something ridiculous, like ten pounds a year, or it was it was a pretty low membership at the time. Um, and I used to get a, a lift through there and play there. But it was really like my granddad. It was my granddad that was in the family that that he was quite a golfer um, and played at a, a golf course called Tariff. Um, and so I suppose that was the first. Um, that was the first time I really was was given a golf club and a golf ball and, you know, here you go, have a whack. So he used to take me down to the practice area at Tariff Golf Club when we used to go and visit my uh, uh, granny and granddad. And um, and that was kind of my first uh, introduction to golf, really. And then, as I say, it kind of just grew from grew from there. When did you realize you were pretty good at golf and wanted to be a golf pro? I think when I first actually got into Elgin as a junior, um, and I remember kind of playing, it was, it was relatively, I mean, I was, I was, I think I was playing off 28 at the time. It was first handicap, my first, you know, pretty much my first tournament. Um, and it was a three day open at Elgin, the junior event. And, you know, I, I did quite well. I, I, you know, I got my handicap cut in qualifying and I got through to um, the match play stages and I won my first round. And then I remember getting drawn with someone and everybody in the club said, oh, you, you're going to get hammered by this guy. He's, you know, he's great. He's really good. He hits at a mile. And, and I'm saying, oh, yeah, you know, probably will do. And I remember going out there and, and, and you know, beat him coming down the last. And then uh, eventually won the final. It was like eight and seven on, you know, by the 12th green. So at that point, you know, you know, first first event, you know, almost. And, you know, picked up the trophy. And at that point, I suppose you, you get you get a glimpse of something and you think, wow, you know, this is this what it's always like. So that that was really probably from pretty much from the offset of when I, when I was a, a, an Elgin member, that really got it in the head that yeah, you know, I'd love to be a professional and I'd love to to do this for a living. Yeah. Um, so that would be the start of it for for sure. So how long have you been a pro now? I was just trying to sort of think about that the, the other day. So um in total, since I, I probably started doing my training, it's, it's been 20 years, um, probably sort of 17 years as a fully qualified. Um, and I've now been at Murray for 14 of those. So this is my this is me going into my 14th season um, at Murray. So um, it was it was down at Glen Eagles that I, I, I went through my, my training. So the uh, Ryder Cup venue um, a few years back. And um so I did sort of three years training, went through my, my training there. And then obviously I think it was another three years um, working within the academy and, um, you know, and doing, doing, doing lessons, et cetera, you know, working at some of the big events and things that they had. Uh, and, and then that was when the opportunity arose to, to apply for, for the uh, Murray, Murray Golf Club position. Yeah. Well, Glen Eagles is a world-class golf venue. That must have been a lot of fun because I it's, quite different working at a, a, a club like Glen Eagles or um, Castle Stewart than, than working at a kind of a members club, as I would call it, like Murray. Yeah, absolutely. Very different. I mean, it was a great, you know, great experience. I think 
it was when I left kind of university, I, I had a friend who was working in the in the golf shop um, at Glen Eagles, and it was him who said, you know, I'll get you, you know, I'll get you a summer job. So really initially started by just going, to, going along for a summer job, and and then they, they eventually said, you know, there's a space, we'd like to keep you on. Um, and at that point, I then kind of got in, in tow and, and, you know, was playing a little bit of golf there, and um, eventually a job, you know, became available as a, as a trainee golf pro, and uh, even at that point, I'd, I'd obviously, back in the day, I'd really kind of, you know, set my sights on becoming a golf pro. And then I think probably kind of latterly, I, I maybe had thought that that kind of dream had gone. I think my understanding of it really at that point was that you were, you know, you had to be a, a playing professional. You had to be, you know, Tiger Woods on the TV. And, and that right. was the only avenue to go down. I, I don't think at that point I really kind of thought too much about about the kind of club professional side of things and the fact that, yeah, you know, you need to be a very good golfer, et cetera, but you, you know, you don't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, at someone like uh, Tiger or McElroy's level, um, right. you know, to, to have a good career and, and things. So I think it was at that point I suddenly, suddenly realised that, there, you know, there was still an opportunity to, to pursue that, you know, this avenue, if you like. I'm disappointed you didn't mention Bob McIntyre as your, you know, he's, <laughs> You mentioned an American well, yeah, and an yeah. Irishman, but not a, a Scotsman. I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm hopeful. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful now in terms of if you were, were to ask me, you know, favorite golfers and things. I do, I love kind of McIntyre, and you're always kind of keen to watch the, you know, how some of the Scottish guys are going. You know, for a, for a number of years, we probably didn't have a, a huge amount to cheer about on the on the tour. Back in the day, it was Sam Sam Torrance and um, you know, Colin Montgomery and. Uh, some of these guys and um and then it kind of got a little bit quiet on the on the tour um but it's great to see there's actually some some really good kind of young up and coming guys well, McIntyre probably uh, the real noticeable one at the moment so uh um yeah, yeah more think... notes those other other names just just you know that that back in the day that was the goal wasn't it everybody everybody wanted to be Tiger or or McElroy and things when they were kind of growing up but you know at that at those stages yeah well it's uh... Obviously, I'm a big fan of Scottish golf, and I, I think that the names that you mentioned are all, they were remarkable players. Um, one of my favorites is Paul Lowry. He's just, you know, when he won the Open at Carnoustie, that was great. But over in the States, we've got uh, Martin Laird, who's, he, he's been here so long, he's kind of lost his Scottish accent, right? And Russell yeah, yeah. Knox is over here. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, they've done, you know, they've done really well for themselves, isn't it? It's almost been like their, you know, their whole career has has predominantly been, you know, based in, um, you know, in the in the United States and things. So they, yeah, they've done great. So it's always great to st still keep, keep an eye on those and um, buy the flag for Scotland for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was I, every time that I'm there. Um, whether it's for the Murray Open, which is obviously your busiest week of the year, year, but other times that I'm there, you're always busy. I'm guessing you don't get to play much golf yourself anymore, or do you? No, no. I, you know what? Every every year, about this set of time, I, I you know I set myself, I suppose, like New Year's resolutions, and I sort of say, right, you know, this this is going to be the year. I'm going to play more golf this year. Um, yeah, it does become difficult. It's uh, you know when you speak to people and. And sometimes they ask you what you do and you tell them, you know, they, 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 the normal response is, well, it must be fantastic playing golf every day for, for a living, you know, and you think, you know, if only you knew, you know, it's, uh, I, I certainly play less golf now than, than, I did, than I ever did as, you know, when I was an amateur. Um, and, uh, and certainly over the last you know, couple of years, just with COVID, et cetera, kind of, um, it's also been a, you know, a bit of a challenge because once things reopened, you know, we had a kind of real, you know, we had a boom really for, for yeah. a couple of years, and, um, certainly with membership, etc. And it was, it was even more difficult to, to get the time to, you know, you'd lost, you'd lost some, some big months. And so when things reopened and, uh, and the business was there, you know, you really had to just kind of, uh, yeah, stay as busy as you could for as long as you could, you know, you just didn't know in the corner. So, but yeah, we have plans this year. We keep saying, so Derek and I are kind of planning, uh, Derek's my, my, um, assistant, Derek and I are, planning on trying to maybe uh, get some kind of you know member matches going where we maybe the two of us put some dates up on the on the clubhouse and uh, we get maybe some members to stick their names down against us and you know we'll go out and have a little challenge match and um, 
and see how that goes. So that that would be uh, that's the plan to kind of get us out there playing a little bit more golf this year for sure. That sounds like a lot of fun. Hey, I know that yeah. we've got the uh, pipeline going through the course at the moment. I know that's delayed. Those delays mean penalties are being collected. Um, hopefully, that money's going to go to a new club or a new pro shop. Correct. <laughs> well, here's here's hoping. Here's hoping that has been discussed um, discussed that you know a few times over the over the 14 years I've been here. So, um, but I suppose you know committees change and captains change and uh, clubs evolve and, and, and can move you know pretty quickly. So, um, but fingers crossed. You know, I think with uh, with the you know with some of the compensation that we're we're getting through. Um, through the work that's that's ongoing at the moment, uh, you know, we've been investing, we are reinvesting that back in the in the golf courses, um, as I'm sure maybe Kevin, yeah, uh, who I think you spoke to yesterday was uh, was probably going through. Um, but hopefully, you know, hopefully um, we have started the process again, so we've kind of uh, picked back up where we we left off the last time we you know we looked at the situation, and fingers crossed, you know, within the uh, the near future we may we may have a a nice new shop eventually sitting down at the bottom of that that bray that you can see behind you so uh, well, yeah. will you build it on the same spot or will it be further down to the right of the first fairway or where will you put it yeah no i think i think i mean as i say we're, we're kind of revisiting a little bit so we probably will go back and you know and talk about maybe various options uh you know things like probably just over your your shoulder on the left behind the flags there you know some people were saying oh you know up on the up on the what is currently the putting green overlooking, you know, it'd be a great thing. Some people were talking about being up in the clubhouse, et cetera. But um, I think we kind of always reverted back to it being down on the, you know, on the first tee. I think um, just from a point of view of um, being able to kind of, you know, people are always asking, you know, who's on the tee now and managing the first tee really, it's, that's also kind of part of our, uh, our duties during the day. So I, th I think it's a difficult thing to do when you're, you know, if you're going to be quite far away or up in the clubhouse, so we, you know, we like to be down on the first tee and and being in amongst all the uh, the thick of it, thick of the action. You know, yeah. so uh, I would imagine, I would imagine we are limited a little bit down there for space, but I think that is still still the um, the the proposed venue for it. Yeah. So we yeah. shall we shall see. As I say time time will tell. But we'll ho hopefully next time when we see you, we'll we'll have some some. Uh, some news or further news on that so well i hope you can triple the size of it that would be even that would be small but uh yeah yeah no i, I certainly think we're you know that that would be the thing you want to try and as well you want to try and future proof it you know there's no point in building something and then in five years time thinking actually we, we should have made it bigger or we should have so uh certainly we've got that in, in, in mind to make sure that it's you know it's set up for uh, the future i mean that when you're down there, that just across the road, um, you know the old sail or what is the current sailing club that used to be the that used to be the pro shop in there. So actually, that's you know if you actually look at that, it's, a, it's, it's you know and that was back in the maybe the sixties or so and seventies, uh, and um, it's actually a bigger shop there than than what we've got now. You know, so um, does the club own that property? No, no. Yeah. Uh, I would have, I'd have to be careful what I would probably say here in terms of, I believe, you know, again, back in the day, you know, I hear sort of rumours and things. I don't actually know, and I'm not sure if anybody really does know what the actual, um, the, the, the proper story was. You know, I think at the time, maybe the, I'd heard the captain of the, captain of the golf club was also linked to the sailing club. And I think they, they sold to the, I think at the time there was slight issues with insurance, you know. So obviously I think it may be being, um, flooded at one point the seed came in and um it is sitting at a lower level there so i think at that point um they struggled to maybe get you know shop insurance after yeah. that um and so at that point i think they they sold it to to the sailing club and and um so yeah i mean it would be it would be nice i mean i think you could do things nowadays to to um stop the flooding element of it but um but uh, no, onwards and upwards. Hopefully, uh, you know it's it's great what it is, and I say there's there's a lot less risk of something like flooding happening there. So uh, so hopefully, as I say, we can we can kind of get something going and and just to create a 
you know, not only just for, for members and giving them a nice set of experience, but it is, I mean, that's your first port of call. That's for, for a lot of people who will park down on the on the beach car park, you know, the walk up through through the gap there and, and the first place that they'll go to is is the pro shop. So it's the first port of call and I think it, it, right. it is really important. We've got two courses, two great golf courses there and uh, I think, you know, that is your first impression and I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's important that we, um, you know, we, we make that as as attractive and, and as great a proposition as we, we can to, to everybody. So, uh, yeah, I'm very hopeful and, and finger, I've got my fingers crossed, I've got all my fingers crossed here that, that in the next, uh, you know, in the, in the near future, next of, uh, uh, or so that we, we hopefully will see some, some development yeah. on that for you. Yeah, I, so, well, I think for visitors, it's important. I think it'd be great for you from hosting visitors, people from overseas. I think yeah. it's, um, yeah, I, I, I think it'll help you sell more. I think it'll help the club yeah. make more money. I think it's, it's just one of those things, you know, when you think about it during like Murray open week is your busiest week. And, um, the, the pro shop is so small that I'm sure people start to walk in and there are four or five people in there and you're like, well, it's a little crowded. So they don't go in. Um, and I know that when we come over, the, my guys, we all spend a hundred, well, more than that, probably closer to 200 pounds each in the shop on, you know, sweaters and hats and balls and whatever else we, you know, golf, whatever we need, we, we get from you, obviously. But, yeah. you know, one of the things, John, I think it's great that you've done, you've got an indoor performance center. How's that going now? Yeah, you know, it's really, it's really kind of uh, taken off. We actually look back now, so I think we put that in. Uh, you, you kind of lose track of time, I think, with everything that's been going on in the last couple of years. But I think we put that in at the start of 2019. Um, so, again, we didn't really have the space, obviously, with you know within the shop or anything like that. Um, and I think one of the initial plans, you know, on the front was maybe to try add in a, in a so teach studio or indoor um, studio in, into that. But um, it was just one of those. We're up in the clubhouse and there's a couple of, there's like an old flat, you know, part of the, I suppose back in the day, the, the steward of the golf club who would look after the bar and look after the club, etc. And part of part of their position would have been that, that they would have got property or a, uh, a property with the with the post, with the job. Um, so there is a sort of flat up in the, uh, in the the back of the clubhouse that a lot of people probably aren't aware of, wow. um, and so that had been back in the day. I think it would be in a three bedroom flat, and then over the years they'd taken a couple of rooms to use as storage, etc. I think at one point we had a sort of junior, a little bit of a junior locker room up in there, um, and so when we were sort of looking at you know where else could we put something like this, and you know an indoor studio, we we suddenly looked at this kind of room and thought, oh, you know, it's quite high ceilings in there. Yeah. Um, um, and so it, I suppose it just one day sort of being in there next thing I'm standing in this room swinging a golf club thinking yeah I could swing a golf club in here and and it kind of just materialized from there so you know we knocked we knocked through um, you know we knocked two rooms together if you like and um, and created a, a bigger space um, and then like you say before you know it we're, we, you know, we, we managed to have a, a real nice kind of indoor studio there so um, so as you walk sports. As you walk out of Stevie's office into that conference yeah. room, that large, what I would call big conference room, behind yeah. there is where the studio is, correct? Yeah, so but actually behind Steve, the secretary's office, yeah. So as you come to the top of the stairs... The oh, it's behind office, Stevie's sort of, office. Behind Stevie's office. So I not in, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you actually ever drive into the club, you know, and, and go into the, the top car park, there's yeah. actually a door sort of sitting there, and that's the that's the, the door to get into the flat, uh, or, or sort of what was was um, the, the flat there. So, um, so there's still you know the flat is still there. Um, it's at the moment we're kind of looking. Um, we used to have kind of some staff that stayed in there and things. So we're looking at things that we could possibly do, you know, whether we turn that back into or invest a little bit and um, you know turn that into some kind of. Uh, rental property that we can rent out to golfers, et cetera, or, you know, we've also been looking at various options and maybe even the possibility of extending what we've, what we've already got here with the, uh, the one, um, the one simulator, um, maybe even adding in a little sort of indoor putting studio or, 
um, depending on on the space that we've got, you know, could we add in a, an, a, an additional simulator? So there's a couple of couple of things, couple of options that we're kind of looking at as a club, and just to see what what we think is maybe the best best way forward to utilise that space. So in poor weather or even in good weather, I suppose you could give lessons up there, correct? Yeah, I mean this, you know, certainly in Scotland in the winter. I mean, we now look back at it and think, gee, what what did we do beforehand? You know, how did we how did we survive through the winter beforehand? Um, I mean, especially today, I mean, we, we do have, you know, we do have an undercover or a couple of undercover bays out in our practice area, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's it's not directly or it's not particularly close to the to the shop. You'll know yourself with, with Murray being a, a traditional Lynx that starts in the town, you know, goes nine holes out and nine holes back. Um, you know, back in the day, they didn't particularly think about, you know, you know, driving ranges and practice areas as a as a, a big thing probably back in the day. So, so we have a, a you know an outdoor practice area, but it's probably what is it two holes, two full holes, a par four and a, a par five away from from the you know from the pro shop. Right. Uh, so we've got a couple of outdoor bays there that we can use, um, you know, for for lessons in poor weather, etc. Um, but even sometimes that, even under shelter, you know, I mean, if you've got some high winds and it's you know, it's uh, anywhere close to zero degrees. It's uh, you know nobody particularly likes to yeah, go out and have a yeah. have a golf lesson in that kind of conditions when you can't you can't feel your fingers. So um, so it has it's really it's really helped us over the last you know couple of years. And um, you know so we'll have people coming in for lessons. Uh, the big one probably is you know it's like club fittings. It's really allowed us to uh, excellent. I mean, so beforehand we you know we would have a lot of, sort of fit equipment shafts heads etc uh, for you know the companies that we use and we had to kind of store them all in the pro shop so you think the pro shop small as it is but you can imagine having to fit all your your club fitting gear in there as well all your demo product all your um so that became quite quite a challenge so now we're able to move all that up into the into the studio so we've got all like different shafts etc up on the walls and you know we've got all the different you know club heads whether that's irons or um and you know that that's that's allowing us to do club fitting to you know a, a whole different level um, and it just means so much easier you know when i need to change a head you know i'm just grabbing it off the wall you know popping it in and whereas before we would have had to grab you know if you were coming for a club fitting you know we'd maybe have to try and get an idea of which brand you wanted before you started and then we had to maybe put all these shafts into golf bags and put all the heads and put them on the back of a buggy and drive them two holes out in the middle of the yeah. middle of the golf course and you know you actually think back and think god gee was how did we how did we manage it back in the day um so it, it's really kind of it's made our well it's made the, the the product offering that we that we give to the to the customer and the member um it's brought that to a whole new level and um and it's made life life and time management uh, you know much better for um for ourselves down in the pro shop so that's for sure and well, we get I, a lot it, of people at our club we've got a a uh, simulator and it's next to the bar and restaurant and it's it's used right. not for club fitting but for um, sure. games so like yep. i was there last friday night with there were about five of us and they've got tables and leather chairs and so it's like a party atmosphere so we put up the old course at saint andrews and so there were two people that hadn't played there so we're going we're picking holes that we want to play and they've got clubs there so you don't have to bring your own clubs and um i don't know what they charge per hour for that but it's probably fifty dollars an hour or sixty five dollars mm -hmm. an hour something like that so yeah. you know like 45 quid would an hour and yeah. and then they we probably spent 150 dollars on drinks and in food while we were there i mean it's a great profit center from that perspective yeah absolutely it's um so yeah we you know out with the lessons and the fittings so you can do anything from you know social gameplay where you go and tee up and you know play the old course if you want to play or the old course andrews or um you know we've got like pebble beach on there and things so you can play we've got you know i think we've probably got now close to about 30 golf courses on there on our one um you can you know if you want to just go out and practice you might have let's say you can you can have four of you playing around the golf and you know drinking beers and there at the same time yeah um you can if you want to just go in there yourself and practice you can go in there and do that you, you know you can set it on a particular hole you want to put it on the 
you know, the postage stamp at Royal Troon and just stand there and, and practice hitting, you know, short irons into the green. You can just, you can do that. You can set it up to have long drive competitions, nearest the bin competitions. So, we, you know, we do try and use it for sort of some members' events through the season, um, yeah. you know, which is great. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's it's really really a great thing for that. And and like I say, you know, just especially in the winter time when you know maybe there's fish in Scotland, it's you know gets dark pretty quickly in the afternoons and things. So uh, you're not getting out there on the on the, uh, the practice area. We've not particularly got a whole lot of, of practice facilities in the area in terms of from a floodlet. There is a there is a small driving range just um, along from the golf club, but it's you know there's only four bays there. Um, so you know, there's not a whole lot, that, um, you know, in, in the local area from a practice point of view, especially when it gets dark. So you know, uh, once it's dark in the winter, people can come along, come down, practice, play, or like I say, just socialise with their friends over a over, over a few beers. So you know, it's uh, it, it's been fantastic for that, and we we really do see it being used for for a variety of those those areas, which is which is fantastic, you know. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the golf course. I'm gonna, which leads me to the next question. That was going to be, what's your favorite golf course? But I think I know the answer to that. You've played Pebble Beach, right? I haven't played Pebble Beach. Oh, no, that's where no. you want to play. I do want to play Pebble Beach. Yeah, I, I was actually, I was actually speaking to, um, uh, I was speaking to earlier on. We were, we were just back from this Scottish Golf Tourism Week. Um, just literally got back um, um, last night, late last night. Um, and I was speaking to a, a, a fellow American and um, he asked me the question of what, what golf course, you know, any golf course in the world that I would like to play. And of course I said, it was, uh, you know, it was Augusta, it was at the Masters. <laughs> and he wasn't impressed with that answer at all. He was very, very disappointed in that answer. Just, um, you know, and I'm saying, it's just because it's, so, it's so exclusive. We just can't, you know, it's so difficult to get on and things like that. But he, was, he wasn't happy with that answer uh, at all. Um, but uh, I, I have played a couple of courses. The one that I, I really enjoyed was uh, was lucky enough to play Riviera um, in Beautiful Los Angeles, course. yeah, which was which was amazing. But and, and of all things, we actually uh, believe it or not, we actually played it in a five ball, which uh, which was which was wow. quite quite strange. But, uh, I think they'd said at the time. I think because it was um, that you know they even have some members going out in seven balls there. I was told so. Uh, wow. <laughs> Um, but that that was a fantastic course. We played it just after the um, you know the PJ Tour event, um, so all the stands and things were still up there. And uh, I remember getting onto that one and, and you know onto the putting green, and I thought, God, these these greens look a little bit a little bit quick. And um, I think I had like a wee eight eight foot putt down the hill and proceeded to knock it off the off the front of the green. You know, and at that point, I thought, oh, this place is pretty pretty special. So uh, that I think that's certainly where I've played that. You know where you know, sort of experienced greens to be at their quickest. And I think at that point I had a, 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 a an increased respect for the, you know, the, the putting skills of a lot of the players on tour, yeah. on tour, you know, you know, you were getting to sort of 20, 30 feet and you're, you're thinking, how, how do I get this down in, in three shots, not two shots <laughs> or one shot, you know? So, um, yeah, you know, that was, that was great. And then I've also been like the other courses, probably um, I was lucky enough to get a game at, um, uh, Isleworth, yeah, in Florida, uh, yeah, in Florida, Tiger, yeah. Tiger used to be, yeah, yeah. So, um, dreaming about you know owning one of those lovely houses that that you saw all the way around, you know. Um, so yeah, no, we were kind of lucky enough to play a couple of those those courses, and they were they were pretty special. So, um, so yeah, but uh, what's your favorite links course? You know, I I always really I I struggle to sometimes just you know say one. Uh, I still actually don't know. I think for, for various reasons, you know, I mean, you've got, you know, I mean, there's like the old course at St. Andrews, you know, I'm not a massive fan. It's, it's great to play it, but, you know, it's like the experience of going down one, 17 and 18, you know, or just, you could just play those, those three holes in itself. And it's just, you know, in the bunkers, you know, really deep bunkers and almost like hanging off the lip of the bunker and thing. So, you know, it's just, so some courses, it's just, it's just the, just everything around it and the, and the, the experience and people walking about and so you know and then you've got we, we, we went down and played um, down in a place called Macrahanish have you, you been down there at I all have before? yeah 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 went down there for the first time and you know that was that was just like a beautiful area and uh, we played um, Macrahanish Macrahanish Dunes and 
uh, you know, that was that was like a great experience as well. And um, did you you didn't play uh, Dunaverty? We didn't know we were we were we were definitely recommended. We were we were on a I suppose a little bit of a schedule. We you know initially we we were told to do that, and, and certainly if we would go back, we, you know, they, they recommended we do that. Uh, and we were you know when we were you know we we're trying to figure out how could we maybe go and play, um, like say the Macri. I haven't I haven't been in you know to play the Macri, um, yet. And and uh, there's even a course now over in what's next to that. Although it's a little bit more private at the moment, I've, I've kind of gone blank. Um, oh, I know which one you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah, very private, very expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I do, I do have a contact there, so um, I'm kind of fingers crossed that he's he's maybe he's maybe help, maybe able to help me out a little bit there. But um, yeah, there looks like there's some fantastic courses, and, and the Macri certainly looks like it would be a uh, a great one to get over and play as well. But uh, just with a, with a couple of these courses, they're not the easiest to get to, you know. Right. Yeah. Uh, have you played we, we, Dunbarney? I have. Yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, no, it was great. Yeah, the clubhouse wasn't built at that point. They were they were kind of still operating out of a, a temporary yeah. clubhouse. Um, it's a funny one. I, I I think it's yeah, I really enjoy. It. I think it's very playable as well. I mean, obviously the weather can change, and I think that's the big thing in Scotland, but especially in Lynx golf, you know, you get a nice flat, calm day, and and sometimes the you know some of the Lynx courses can be very playable and very scorable. But you know, you sometimes get a wind blowing, and you know they're 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 different beasts altogether, you know. Yeah. And so I was like, I played it on a relatively calm day, and it and it felt very playable. I think. I think the thing is sometimes some of the golf courses can be a little tough, um, and you know if you're playing uh, and you're, you're on a bit of an off day and you start losing golf balls left, right, mm -hmm. and centre, um, you know some of these courses can be pretty uh, unforgiving. And you know I think by the time you've lost your tenth golf ball, you you know you're probably not enjoying your game of golf. So I think um, I think they've done it really well. They've you know fantastic green complexes, big greens, and uh, some beautiful scenery and things in the area, and the course was in great, great condition. Um, I I played particularly well, you know, myself that day, and, and I think that always helps. If you play well on a golf course, I think right. you always remember it pretty fondly. Um, whereas if you go out there and have a, you know, a hell of a day out there, um, you know, as much as you might appreciate the golf course and think, yeah, great condition and what you know, what scenery, it's it's funny, you know, if you've had, had the worst day. On golf course for some time out there somewhere, you know, I, I can't help but think you you don't remember it with the fondest of memories, right? You know, because you, you're always remembering. Oh, I played really badly that day. Didn't like that. Didn't like it at all. You know. So, um, and I think that's the thing about it. It's 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 pretty fair. You know, it's a little bit like um, so this was like Castle Stewart along the road from us, right? Um, you know, you know, great great golf course and things, but um, you know, actually quite fair and relatively. Not easy off the tee, but you know you you can you can kind of hit it a little bit, a little bit flying, and, and you know still find it and uh, and hit it again, which which makes a difference if you keep keep uh, playing with the same ball as long as you can round some of the links courses. Right, you know, you're you're going to do well. You're going to enjoy your experience a little bit more. I always think. Well, I think yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what. From um, what's interesting, you know, my other business, I coach businesses on how to be more successful, how to make more money. And one of the things that we talk about is when I ask them, who are your, who's your competitor, right? They'll give a traditional answer. They'll say, like, you might say, well, Nairn Dunbar and Nairn and, right? But what I try to get my clients to look at is that companies like, I'm, I'm, and excuse me for being so North American centric, but I would say Nike, Disney, Apple, Amazon, FedEx have all shaped our clients' expectations of how they want to be served, right? And when you think about the way that Kings Barnes, Dumbarney, Castle Stewart um, have built very playable golf courses, almost geared to an American or European audience, yeah, right? It's the welcome you get, it's completely different than what you get at smaller golf clubs or even the championship venues like Carnoustie. They are truly happy to see you because you're paying them an ungodly amount of money. And they, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing. Now, 
one of the things that we do, John, we try to get, we want all of our travelers to go to places like Murray. We think it's yeah. great to meet people like you and the members. And, you know, when you go to the bigger championship courses, um, you're typically not meeting members. You're the thing that I hate the most is getting to, I remember going to Bally Liffin, which isn't necessarily a championship course. It's a great course. And we pull up and there's a busload of Americans with yeah. New York, New Jersey accents, like, Typical ugly Americans, the prototypical or stereotypical ugly Americans. What's it take to get a beer around here? Where are the golf carts? You know, um, yeah. when you go to Murray or Tain or, you know, Brora or, you know, Crail, those places, it's it's a it's a much different experience. It's a good it's a it's a wonderful low key experience. But the Completely different from what you get at Castle Stewart and Dunbarney and Kings Barnes, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think the word authentic is probably what, you know, an authentic experience, right. a real experience. A lot of these courses are, you know, they are fantastic and what they've done, they look, they look great and there's no doubt about that at all. But I suppose, you know, a lot of people come to Scotland because it's the home of golf, you know, this is where it all began and this is, you know, you know, tradition and history and, and all these things and, and some of these you know, modern clubs as, as great as they are as, as golf courses, they you know they, they certainly haven't got that. And like you say, that that th authentic feel like a true Scottish experience, you know, it's, it's a, that's a difficult thing to replicate in a you know in a you know one of these big kind of golf resorts or or, or um you know the, the, the trophy courses sometimes right. because I think there's that many people coming through as well. You know, the number of visitors that they're dealing with on a daily basis, but it's almost, some of them are almost just visitor only, you know, no members. It's just, right. you know, they're just targeting visitor golf only. And so as a result, I suppose that, you know, I suppose there's sometimes you can feel like, you know, it's a little bit like a corporate machine, you know, you sometimes you, you become a number in amongst, right. you know, right. everybody else that's playing, you know. So we're, you know, we're a, we're a big, we're a blend. We obviously like to try and encourage people to come and play our golf courses, especially kind of from overseas and things. But, um, you know, obviously, you know, first and foremost, we're a members golf club. And, and so we have to kind of try and blend that together. Right. And I think the nice thing as well is that the members are pretty good on the whole with um, with having visitors on the golf course. And you get a lot of members that really like interacting with uh, with visitors and, you know, we'd be happy to sit up in the bar and, you know, tell them some stories and, you know, have a whiskey with them and things like that, which I think is that's definitely an experience that, you know, you, you can't really replicate at some of these big, uh, bigger, bigger venues. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, John, I wasn't intending to uh, ask this question, but by looking at your backdrop, I can see that there are at least 15 bottles of, of whiskey behind you. So I know that when you talk about whiskey, you've, you're, you're fond of a wee dram now and again. You know what, I've, I've, I've become more acquired to the taste, shall we say, um, I, I haven't always been that way. And I, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say I drink a lot of whiskey. Um, I uh, I think the very first whiskey tasting I went to, I remember getting given sort of four or five whiskeys and, you know, they would say, you know, what, what do you smell in that? And would you smell the chocolate or the, you know, the sweetness? And, and I'm just I'm thinking, oh, you know, yeah. it's just whiskey. Um, but I think over the years, certainly since probably I really came to Murray, I, you know, I've, I've kind of, I've almost wanted to, to get into whiskey. And so I've, I've, um, I've certainly... Uh, changed my palate a little bit and I do you know I do enjoy a whiskey actually probably the best place for a whiskey is actually on the golf course for me I really enjoy you know especially if you're out there and you know the weather's a little bit poor and you've got you know, a bit of wind in your face and some, a little bit of rain and it's not the nicest of days and you, you know you stop in the tea and you have a little whiskey with your playing partners I think that's sometimes the uh, the, the best place for it well um, I'll tell you what we, I'll tell you what what's interesting is uh Oh yeah, the club. So this is uh, gathering a little bit of dust there, but here's one of our. Um, so this is one of our. Um, this is I don't know if you can see that there, 125th anniversary um, edition. So this was a uh, space side whiskey. Um, this was to mark the 125th anniversary of the golf club. So um, we have our own casks laid um, at a local distillery, Glen Murray, which is in Elgin, um, and obviously they allow us to bottle whiskey and you know something's put our own labels on them so we had uh um in fact we, that was that was one of those whiskeys that you spotted on that 
uh, photo that you saw online the other day. We had yeah, a I was going to mention year old, Yeah, it was a two hundred year old. Um, well, not a two hundred year old, but it was a. It was, okay, it was an old Tom Morris, uh, two hundred year anniversary whiskey that we took out um, to mark his, uh, the great man, two hundred years. Um, I think it was last year. He was he would have been two hundred years old now. You know, old yeah. Tom Morris. So we uh, we had kind of we had a special whiskey there that we that we sell in the club, and we have our own sort of club whiskey, which is a a fifteen year old Glen Murray that's uh, that that we uh, that we sell in the club and in the bar, and you can buy bottles of whiskey there as well. So. Um, so yeah, whiskey, whiskey is obviously very much a part of, of Scotland and, and in particular the Murray and Speyside area. I think we have over 50, 50 operating distilleries in a concentrated small area, which is about it's over a third of the total distilleries in the whole of, whole of Scotland. Well, I, um, in, it's, addition, it's a big part of it. in addition to that, John, the club was founded by whiskey distillers. So the history, yeah, the yeah. legacy of the club goes back to whiskey distillers. And what John mentioned a moment ago, I, I made a post on social media the other day. And John, it's a true story. If you walked into our clubhouse with me on any given day, and after a round, you said, let I said, let's have a wee dram, you'd have a choice of three or four um, whiskeys, and two of them are single malts, and one is a, a crap blend. So, so the post was at Murray, they've got 64 different single malt whiskeys available which um is just phenomenal that's one of those differences to sell you know you want to celebrate the differences between um golf in the u.s and golf in scotland right or that's what we try to get our visitors to do right is to to embrace um the culture of scotland and to and to search out some of those authentic experiences like murray or a, a, a tour of the Glen Murray distillery or another distillery. Those are always fun. Absolutely. Yeah. All part of the, all part of the trip. It would be a, a shame to come over and, and, and not experience it, even if you're not a big whiskey fan, you know, and um, I think going to these, especially some of the other, I mean, some great ones in the area, you know, and some, some bigger and some that are, are more renowned, if you like, probably to, to overseas guests and things, but they're all, they all offer a great, a great distillery tour and um yeah but certainly if you're not a big whiskey fan it's certainly certainly something that you should, should uh, experience um you know and, and and see the difference you know <laughs> there is a big difference between all the whiskies out there and, and uh, uh, as i say you can certainly if you don't want to go and do a distillery tour and you're over for for golf you know you can certainly there's plenty that you can try at the golf club that's for sure now john we were talking about the differences that we wanted to celebrate between Scotland in the U.S. and the the job of a club professional in Scotland is very different than the job of a club professional here. Or I, I shouldn't say very different, but it is different. As an example, I know you run your shop, and it, which is a traditional model over there. You you basically own the shop and make money by selling the products, and you you run the tea times and the tournaments. That's similar, but over here even though the club professional is responsible for marketing what's in the shop, they don't profit from the sale of anything in the shop. Are there other differences that, that you can think of between being a club pro in the U S and being a club pro in the British Isles? Um, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Like, like you sort of say, um, you know, I mean, it's changing a little bit. You are sometimes finding like some of the newer venues, you know, for example, like say your Castle Stewart, your Dunbarney. I don't know what, you know, what, what the situation is with all of those, um, you know, your, your resort courses like say Glen Eagles and things like that, you know, they would, they would be very much, the shop would be part of the, you know, of the, the owners of Glen Eagles or whoever it may be. And, and, and probably the, the, the professionals would be more on a, an employed basis. Um, but like you say, at your traditional kind of members clubs, I suppose that the idea of, or what, what used to happen and still happens at, at the majority of them is that, um, you know, you're you're put on a retainer, you're retained by the club um, and the, the retainer that the club would pay you, um, you know, you would you would get your, you know, the shop would be provided as part of your your package, I suppose. And um, and you obviously uh, you have to staff it. So, you know, my staff. As much as most people, and even a lot of the members, probably still think that, um, you know, they're all employees of the golf club. They're they're actually employees of myself. So I I employ my my own staff, the other professionals, uh, the guys that work in the shop. They're actually employed by myself, not by the club. So 
um, as I say, we all, you know, it is very much a feeling, you know, I always kind of feel like I work for the club and I, I'm a, an employee of the club as such. But um, so I suppose that, you know, that's probably the main difference is, is that, yeah, we, you know, we're, we're retained and, and as, as part of our retainer that we receive from the club, we, we have to provide, you know, a retail experience for the members and visitors. We have to offer club repairs, etc. So we still do, you know, all our, all our, all our own club repairs, etc. Um, and offer coaching, um, et cetera, and, and just get involved with other things at the golf club, you know. Um, so I suppose, like you say, that's probably is, is the, just the way that works. You know, I know maybe speaking to a lot of clubs, you know, you sometimes go into clubs in America and uh, or some of the ones I've been in and they don't tend to, you don't tend to see an awful lot of equipment and things. It, it seems to be done almost by some of the big... The big... Um, retailers. Re- yeah, the big retailers. It almost seems to be, you know, it seems to be quite different... Um, over there that the, the, the clubs don't really get too involved in maybe the equipment things. I'm, I'm not sure if that's is that the case. Well, we've got, in, in, in our, in our, we have a, I belong to a group of clubs yeah. and um, the, um, I, I guess in our cluster of clubs, there might be one, probably five or six, five clubs. Two of them have yeah. outstanding club fitting facilities. Well, let me take okay. that back. One of them has an outstanding the other one has a good one, but yeah, I, that's a, um, I think, you know, a lot of people, we've got club fitting stores here now where you can go to, 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 they just, they just custom fit clubs and then sell you very expensive sets of clubs. Right. Um, but if you go to your, your local PGA professional, um, they can do the fitting and they represent a handful of manufacturers and um, you tend to get a better experience from your local PGA professional than you would from one of those big, either the big retailer where they're not, uh, they may not be PGA professionals or, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you're going you're to pay too much at those big fitting centers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll not go and mention the names in the UK and things, but yeah, there, there, there's some kind of a, the, I mean, there's not there's not a whole lot now of, of big you know um golf golf stores if you like that you know um there's there's a couple out there left but you know a few of them now disappeared and things and you know it's still thankfully it's still predominantly kind of um you know green grass accounts so that that um sell you know most of the the, the clubs have the professionals have you know the all the club fitting equipment etc and, and do that themselves and and can you know thankfully can compete with the the, the the big guys that are out there and I think most people kind of feel like well it's not in my best interest to sell you anything if I'm if I'm just trying to offload what I've got in the shop and it's wrong for you you know it's going to come back and bite me so it's not it's not in my best interest for right for that initial sale and it's not for for a long-term relationship with you know with a customer if uh, if, if they get a good good service and a great service and we fit them for the right product you know hopefully they come back and they you know they buy everything else from us and, and things so I think sometimes with a big the big retailers, isn't it? You know, you like say you maybe don't have sometimes maybe not qualified or the staff aren't maybe as qualified as as maybe you would expect. Um, and you know, sometimes you know, are they are they pushing what's in the shop? You know, are they trying to sell? You know, they've got these big stores and they've got right. you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of stock that they need to get rid of. Are they trying to fit you into something that they have in stock? You know, you know, possibly. You know, so yeah. you know, with us smaller shops, we don't hold huge amounts but you know we have a, a reasonable amount of stock that we hold in the shop but you know the, the majority of our business is, is custom um and so you know we, we book in people for club fittings you know fit them to, to what's great for them and then you know order the product in and i suppose yeah. i think that's you know club fitting has probably been a bit of a lifeline to um you know your your typical club pros in in scotland and the uk from that side of things because we can offer a different service to what the what the bigger guys would do and even like the online you know i mean there's there's a lot of guys online and a lot of people will buy their clubs online still but and you can you can order sort of custom clubs sometimes even now online but you know there isn't a face there's nobody there you know you're not getting that sort of service you can't yeah. come in generally and and get you know, maybe you know um custom fitted by them you know you're just taking a little bit of a, a gamble and then if something goes wrong with the product again you know you're having to email them there's no there's no face-to-face contact, and so thankfully that that gives us a kind of an area where we can try and really, you know, differentiate our, our product from from those guys, and and hopefully, um, 
you know keep people buying from from the club pros you know and uh, yeah and not, it's a not, much better not, experience right i mean it's yeah it, just for those reasons you outlined i i, I agree 100 percent. now john we're about to wind down i got a couple of questions for you and one is you know for those people who uh, haven't been to scotland uh, and haven't played in a murray open what tell us about the murray open and why should americans come over and uh, give it a try well, like I say, we always have beautiful weather there for the Murray Open. It's uh, that's that's a, that's a good always. one. Um, always, always, yeah, just like like it is behind you right now in the in the picture. Um, you know what? It's just a great experience. There's it's it's there's a real buzz about the place. I mean, the the club being in the town, as I say, a typical kind of links golf course starts in the town, finishes in the town. So because we're in the town, the club itself is like a little bit of a a local. Uh, you know, a local kind of drinking place for a lot of, uh, a lot of people that live in, live in Lost Mouth, use it as their, you know, their local, well, it's not a pub, but, you know, use it as their local watering house, shall we say. And um, so you, you'll you get people who are, everybody that's playing in the event, and then you'll get other people who are maybe social members, etc. cetera, um, members who are not playing in the, the, the tournament that week, they'll all come down to the club. So there's a real buzz around the club. Um, both inside and out and as i say it's just you know it's a very fr friendly place to be oh Hi, Jeff. Sorry about that. You're sideways. I'm sideways. Let me try a second. There you go. There we go. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Apologies. So we'll we'll, we'll edit. That. Hayden will be able to edit that out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, just to start again with that bit, or just just pick up where you left off. He'll uh, he'll edit it. Okay. So yeah, whether whether you're you know, whether you're you know playing in the event hall, we have a lot of our members will come down and socialise at the club that week. We've got some live entertainment on there with local bands and singers, etc. Um, so I'd say you know great week, great event on the golf course, very well run. We have a lot of our members who may not play in the event and they'll help out. So we've got lots of people helping. So it's a real kind of well structured and well run event. Um, you know, we have an auction on the Tuesday night and things like that in the clubhouse. And as I say, fingers crossed, the weather is good. And, and as I say, all the way around the green, everybody will take their beers outside, sit around the green, that kind of amp amphitheatre, really around the 18th green. And, um, you know, shall we say maybe slightly heckle heckle people as they're coming down the last hole? You know, I, I would dare say if you've, you've never experienced kind of, um, you know, uh, like playing in a big tournament with people watching you, that's probably the closest that a lot of people will get to having a gallery sitting around right. the green, watching you, you know, hit your approach shots in and and, and, and putting out, et cetera, like that. So, um, you know, it can be a daunting experience, uh, that last hole for a few. But, right. um, but, you know, everybody's in great spirits and it's it's all, you know, it's all part of the, you know, all part of the experience. And, and it's just a real friendly, fun week, you know, for, for everybody involved. So, yeah, I think, John, it's the other thing about it is it makes a golf trip over there very affordable because you're getting five rounds of golf for, you know, the equivalent of probably, is it 150 quid or 125 quid? You know what? I should know this year. Uh, it's a, yeah, but it's it's under yeah, $200. Split, I think it's about 150. It's under 200. Yeah. So let's say 150 pounds. Um, you know, you can actually turn up. So the Saturday before it, we'll run a, um, like a triam. Uh, I think actually this year it's maybe a quad am, so you'll, you you can put your name in with others and you'll play a little kind of fun event, you know, best two scores or best score account on the Saturday. So that's a little kind of start off. Uh, yeah. Normally we also have the, the Open Championship playing at that time, so then you can come back into the clubhouse, watch the golf on the Saturday and on Sunday. 
Um, we have the uh, official practice round starts on the Sunday, so you can go out and play the older or the new um, as a practice round on Sunday, and then the official competition starts on Monday. So we have a qualifying round on each course, so you'll, you'll either play at new old or old new, uh, and then there's a, a draw made, and then we have a scratch section, uh, we have two handicap sections, um, and basically the, the draw is then made and it goes into a match play event. Um, but even if you don't qualify in the match play, we have kind of additional consolation uh, trophies as well. And again, the finals, you know, go through and are played on, on the Friday. We tend to get quite a lot of people going around and following, in particular right. the final on the Friday afternoon, um, which is great. But uh, as I say, you can play really from, you know, you're almost getting, you can play seven days golf if you want. Even on the Friday, we reopen the new course on the Friday. So if you've, right. if you've played in the event that week, you know, you can get seven days golf for, let's say, 100, 150 pounds. It's it's fantastic value for money. And and what you've saved on your on your uh, your green fees, you can just spend in the bar. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I thought you were going to shop. spend it in the pro shop. Yeah. Well, you yeah, can buy exactly, a new yeah. set of clubs for that savings, right? A new right? set of clubs, yeah, yeah. Or a new driver? And I'll buy you a whiskey. And I'll buy you a whiskey in return. Yeah. So that's... <laughs> hey, what... Well, Hey, everyone that's listening, I can assure you he's never bought me a whiskey, and I've been there many <laughs> times. Uh, I'm going to hold him to that this year. So, John, yeah. one other question. So you've got people, um, like we've got some people coming over for the first time. But whether it's the people coming in the group that I'm, that I'm sending or whether it's golfers coming in Murray's their first spot, what advice do you have for people playing Lynx golf for the first time? Well, that's a very good question. I, you know what? I, I suppose, you know, in terms of what you should take with you is probably the, the first one, you know. Um, you know, being prepared uh, would be the big one. So, you know, we can get beautiful weather like you can see in the background there behind Jeff. Um, so sometimes people come over and you get a little bit surprised, they, you know, but I suppose always be prepared for the worst. You know, always always have a couple of layers, you know, because it can get a little chilly out there uh, if, you, if you do get a pretty poor day. So it's... it's Making sure you've got everything uh, a bit like you know the kitchen sink in the in the in the bag there. So be be prepared before you go out would be the first one. Um, you know, even sometimes in April or May, take your beanie with you. You know, stick it in your bag. You never know when you might need to use it. Um, that would be the first thing. I think the the second thing is, um, I suppose, is being able to control the flight of the ball. You know, from from actual playing side of things, and and I think that's where golf is. It's almost like a game of opposites, you know, and what everybody tends to do to, for example, rectify a slice tends to be the completely wrong thing to do. So, you know, you almost, what, what you think you want to do, you almost want to do the completely opposite. And so I think playing Lynx golf, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, maybe in the wind, it's playing more club and hitting it softer. Whereas most people, when it's blowing into, a, you know, into a wind, you know, they're, they're just trying to hit it harder, you know, and you hit it harder right. and it goes goes up in the air it spins more up into the air you lose control of the ball and and things so you know it's definitely learning to place at lots of half shots and you know take you know one or two extra clubs and make a little half swing um so uh you know gearing yourself up you know getting down to the range and practicing your little little links sort of bump and runs that type of thing um you know it's uh it's a definitely a different game and uh, but but i think uh it uses the imagination and it really kind of gets you thinking about different shots rather than just standing up. It's 150 and I just take a club and I just fly a pin. There's lots of different ways you can play a shot, you know, and, and I think that's the great, great thing about golf in Scotland. You know, there's uh, many ways to do it. Well, I, I think it's made me a better golfer playing over there so much because I, it, it's made me more creative. And to your point Absolutely. on the, you know, when it's windy, I, I, the year that I, uh, I think I played in the Maria, I can't tell you how many times, six or seven, I've made it through once and I got to the second round. And I remember the uh, second day of qualifying, it was particularly windy. And I said, I'm just going to play bogey golf, right? Because I know that everyone's scores are going to be really high. So my goal was to just, if I, if I could maintain bogeys all the way around, and, and I was also thinking, hey, on the par fives, maybe I can par those. But what I did was on most par fours, John, I teed off with a five iron, yeah, a full five iron, and then hit kind of a bump and run five iron from the fairway up towards the green. 
and would either put up or, you know, bump and run something up. And sometimes I one putted, sometimes I two putted, but I didn't three putt. And I think I shot 86, which on a windy day like that, for being in the the mid section of the of the go, it got me into the uh, handicap. Got, there were a lot of score, you know, scorecards no return, right? I, I would I would say sometimes people say, oh, you know, you know, if if you were to give somebody a lesson, how many shots can you save them? You know, after one lesson and things like that, and it's, that's a difficult thing to answer because everybody's different, and some people will put some work in, and some people will practice, etc. But I think if you, if I was to go out on the golf course and caddy for somebody, I think that's probably where you could save them the great, especially you know someone that's maybe a more mid to higher handicap. You know, and play, you know, caddy for them and just say, "This is the club. Aim at that and hit that." You know, and and. Don't take on that one in one in a hundred shot, you know. It's just it's oh, you know, there's a chance, there's a small chance, you know. Um, yeah. you know, it can be pretty punishing out there when the wind's blowing and things. And mm-hmm. like you say, sometimes it's just trying to play a hole. There's definitely holes out there when the wind blows that you go, it's a par four on the card, but you know what? It's a truly a par five today. Let's play it as a par five. Let's not try and get there in two and just you know, get it in the thin stuff. That's the big thing. People always say, you know, what what tips would you give going out there? And it's like you know, it sounds like a stupid thing to say, but just make sure you hit the fairway, you know, keep it on the thin stuff. Uh, and if that means, you know, just taking an extra couple of clubs shorter or whatever it is and playing it, you know, three shots to the green, uh, there's certainly holes out there that, you know, you, you're more likely to get away with, uh, away with it. And like, say, over the course of 18 holes, you end up finding that, you know, and even with that, you know, you, you, you play three to the green and you hold the putt and you make a four, yeah. you know, rather than, you know, doing it, doing it that way. Well, it's... Yeah, so what you're saying is take what the course gives you, so to speak. Don't yeah, absolutely, and there'll be times there where the wind then is behind you and favoring you, and, and there'll be some short holes that are drivable, or you know, par fives that you can reach into. So, you know, so there's always going to be, uh, you know, there's always going to be areas where you can open the shoulders and kind of you know be aggressive, and then so it's just probably knowing when to be aggressive and then when to take your punishment and when right. to just same thing with a bunker sometimes, you know, in terms of you know you're stuck under that lip. Sometimes you might have to you know play outside ways or you know rather than trying to be too aggressive with it you know but uh yeah it's respecting the golf course and respecting the elements and uh you know very much yeah. playing within yourself i remember to your point there john i played royal sink ports down in england and they had an open championship back in the 1920s and i played there and it's a traditional out and back course so it was first nine holes were downwind I shot an even par 36 and I'm thinking, and my goal when I play, I want to break 80, right? Yeah. Coming back 44 with a double on, on 18 in, you know, into it like a crazy heavy wind. It was a really disappointing finish. I would have been ecstatic with a 79, but the 80, I did the same thing at the old course. Um, last year, I, I bogeyed yeah, like 18 to shoot 80. Yeah. Which is really and that's it. Yeah. And that old course, you know, our, our old course is, you know, it's a great finishing hole. And, um, you know, it, it kind of, if the wind is favoring, you know, it can actually, you can go in there with something relatively a mid to a short iron. But, you know, if the wind's in the wrong direction or it's coming off the sea, you've got the out of bounds on the right, you know, you get up towards the green, it's the big bunkers on the left, big deep bunkers on the left. You've got out of bounds on the left. You know, there's there's a lot that can go wrong there as well. So it's like you say, and I think that's the great thing about Lynx Golf, isn't it? It's like you can play a hole one day and it's like, oh, I can almost knock on the green here. And the next day you're, you know, you're two drivers to get to the green, you know. So it's uh, it never plays the same, which is, I think, what, what's kind of great about it, you know. Yeah, it's very uh, two quick things and then I'll let you go. The I remember playing the first time I came over after I joined. I played, um, I was out playing by myself two days in a row and I played the 15th, the par three. Yeah. The first day I birdied it with an eight iron. I birdied it the next day with a two iron. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people in the States just don't get that. And the final point, um, and I think you made a good point about why people should go to Murray is what's over my shoulder when you look at the 18th hole it's it's been voted one of the best finishing holes in all of scotland it's certainly a better finishing hole than st andrews and many other 
championship venues. Um, and John, I played it a bunch. I think I've par I've parred it once and birdied it once and bogeyed or double bogeyed it too many times to count. Yeah, absolutely. Like you say, we did lose out. It was the the eighteenth at the the old course in Andrews that 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 uh, pipped us to the. Uh, to the, the post of that one, the, the the second best finishing role in Scottish golf, and I think obviously a little bit of that was down to the history and everything. I, I wouldn't say it's it's the best hole in uh, finishing role in Scottish golf, but uh, there we go. You know, it's nice it's, to be kind of put up there uh, in the likes of that. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say one more thing. I can't, I can't be quiet. You mentioned you played Macrahanish. I think that might be the finest first hole in golf. Yeah, it's a great it's a great first hole you know, with the wind coming, coming off played, the sea. Yeah, we played it. It was relatively calm, so we were kind of it wasn't it wasn't so bad. But yes, yeah, like you say, that the weather can make that um, a pretty challenging hole. So yeah, it's got a great it's a great um, opening hole there, and actually, played, they've got a lovely new clubhouse as well there that they did. It's an okay. It's maybe a little bit modern looking stuff, but big, you know, big, you know, lots of glass looking out over the sea and things. Yeah. So it, it was great when we finished there and came in and. Uh, I think we had a, a nice pint of Guinness when we came in there, actually, as well. There which you was go. Great. Looking over, looking over towards Ireland. Yeah, that's what. That's a wonderful idea. Well, John, you've been very generous with your time. You're a no wonderful problem. ambassador for Murray and for Scottish golf in general. We can't wait to get people coming over to play at Murray and playing in the in the Highlands, and we can't wait to see you in July. The six Absolutely. of us are coming over, and as soon as we hang up, I got to call Stevie. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, it's been a pleasure. Nice to sit, speak to you again. And uh, obviously, if you've got any of your customers, your clients, your friends, anybody who wants to just kind of pick up the phone and, and chat or drop us an email about anything, um, we'd be only too happy to help. Excellent. Thanks, John. Thanks again to John Murray for coming on with us. Um, it's great getting a perspective from a golf professional in Scotland for a Lynx course as well. Um, we're very excited to uh, go and play Murray Golf Club. It'll be my first time, uh, and Jeff has taken me to play the Murray Open, uh, so we're really excited for that. If you enjoyed this, please share the video, like, subscribe, follow, and we'll see you next week.